Hi, my name is Kevin and I collect old irons. Today we're going to be talking about the liquid fuel irons. And when I say liquid fuel, fuel you might be thinking gasoline. And you could be right, but there's a wide variety of liquid fuels. Now is not a time for a discussion on the history of oil refining, but refined oil has various types and mixtures that go from crude oil to kerosene to gasoline to alcohol, and that is just a short list. Some irons could burn a mix of this, some irons would burn some specific liquid fuel. Now, in the past videos, we have started with the earliest irons and progressively moved towards the more modern. I think this time we're going to do it the other way around. We'll start with the, the latest thing to come onto the scene, which might be familiar to some of the viewers, and then we'll work our way back. And the latest thing on the scene is this. This is a Coleman iron. Um, Coleman, of course, producing camp stoves, and many of us are familiar with that. The uh, Coleman irons um, come with this stamped steel trivet, also come with a pump here, and oftentimes with a gas can, which I don't have here. Um, what would happen is that they would light, get some, squirt some gas lean in there, and then you'd light that. There are some uh, YouTube videos you might watch where people are actually firing these things up, and I do mean firing. They light this, and it's just a bundle of fire for a while. It uh, dies down, they're pumping this thing here, and eventually they've vaporized the, the gasoline that's in the pipe here to vapor, and the essentially simple gasoline engine kicks in, and they can do their ironing. Um, the fire process, you might notice the, uh, the burn bit uh, underneath the handle here, and we might remind ourselves the first iron we saw in these videos had burn spot under the handle as well. These irons were made in the United States, in Canada, in Australia, maybe some other places as well, and these were made until 1963. So they were very popular, they have a fairly long history, went through a lot of models. This is the Model 4A, which was perhaps the most common model. The um, a lot of people collect these Coleman irons, and they collect these irons from two different disciplines. There are the iron collectors, and these catch their eye, and some of them are trying to build a big collection of these. They come in various colors, green, red, other things as well. But there's also the Coleman collectors, and the Coleman collectors also collecting these means that there is demand for these, and the rarer models, or the rarer colors, can command some some decent prices. So that is the Coleman iron. And again, we are going back in history this time around. So let's go to this iron. This is an alcohol iron. Uh, last patent date here is uh, 1923. And let me. Um, it's a it's a two burner iron. It has two burners, two knobs on the front. And let me read. The top, it says the alcohol gas twin burner safety iron. That safety name is on the names of some irons or in the uh, marketing, the advertising for various of these liquid fuel irons. And that might seem surprising to you, uh, especially after we've seen the, the burn handle on this iron, but Maybe in comparison to the other new technologies available in quantity at this time, uh, it might have been the safest. The newer technologies, we're talking electricity and we're talking natural gas. The electric irons, just to say a few words about them, in this early part of the 19th century, they did not have a thermostat. So the only temperature they could do was very hot. And so um, you would plug it in, it gets very hot, you'd unplug it, do some ironing, cool, plug it in, hot again, do some more ironing. Um, this was fine, but if you got distracted, 
Or, God forbid, if you were away and your child crawled up and wanted to plug this in just like mommy does, you could lose your house. Besides that, let's understand that electricity in this point in time might be considered scary. I mean, we're talking electrons traveling at the speed of light. Uh, frayed wires could cause electric elect elect electrocutions. Uh, and uh, so the electric irons and electricity of its day was uh, sort of like the nuclear power of our own day. You know, there's perception that might be different from reality, but perception is what's important to a variety of people. So this again is the alcohol iron. Again, going a little bit earlier in time, this iron uh, has the original key, which I'll just keep attached to it. Um, this iron is the um, Ideal Saturn Company. Um, Ideal was an electrical fixture company in those days. Uh, another major uh, uh, company making irons in that time was the Akron um, Lamp Company from Akron, Ohio. And let's just talk a little bit about where these irons came from. We saw in a previous lecture the natural gas irons came from Taylor irons developed by those companies that made um, natural gas stoves. So a lot of cast iron. We saw the, the big, heavy cast iron trivets that are associated with some of these irons. These irons that we're talking about today came largely from the lamp industry. Back in the time before the early 1900s, uh, there were a lot of lamp companies making kerosene lamps. Now, when you're thinking kerosene lamps, you're thinking of one of these things here. Uh, but a lot of the kerosene lamps, the larger kerosene lamps hanging from the ceilings and so forth, um, had, had a, lot of, a lot of metal parts associated with them. And those lamps used there were then built into the headlights of carriages of the late 1890s and into the horseless carriages of the early 1900s. And those lamps basically became the beginning for a lot of these natural gas irons. These natural gas irons not using cast iron are rather using um, steel. Uh, some of them, i.e. the Coleman, had a uh, stamped steel trivets. Maybe some others did, but these uh, trivets, these simple trivets are largely lost. Now, another question about looking at this iron, we might remember that the first two irons we looked at had the tanks in the back. This one has the tank in the front. And that's an important question when you're dealing with the design of these liquid fuel irons. Where do you put the tank? You've got to have a fuel tank, but where does it go? So we have the back, we have the front. Um, this is the imperial iron. The, um, this is a very common iron with patent dates from 1901 to uh, 1911 on this one has a uh, little pump associated with the tank itself. But the tank, I want you to notice, is catty corner to the side and the back. This is an iron from Minnesota. This one has the tank on the side of the iron. This is the standard iron company. Um, maybe about 1912. This one has the tank beneath the handle and I'll go ahead and I'll show an earlier version of that. All the irons that I'm showing in this portion of the video are quite common um, companies that operated for a number of years and uh, because of that there is a variety of models and variation within those models and that's shown by these two irons here. And again, all of these irons are from circa about 1901 to maybe just after 1910. Um, this one's 1909. 
This is the Acorn Company, and this company has the tank within the handle. So we've looked at some of the early irons from the last century. Uh, this particular iron is a bit later in the process. This is about 1935. This is uh, marketed for uh, Sears and Roebuck. I'm sorry, this is Montgomery Ward. Um, and has the pump in the handle again. And this one has a tank that's especially adapted to serve as a stand. So we've now taken a look at some of these irons starting about 1901 moving up, 60 year history to the end of the, um, of the Coleman iron, but let's say a little bit about the irons before that. Now the process of um, firing up these natural gas irons is the trick and those of us who uh, worked with the Coleman stoves know that those can be cantankerous. You can watch the video of firing up the Coleman gasoline um, irons at your pleasure. Let's take a look at the process for the early irons. They did have the process ironed out a little bit after the beginning of the last century. This is a Bergman and Sons iron from Chicago and I do know something about this particular iron because it was, came out of an attic in, in uh, southern Maine that included the original wooden box, the iron, all the sundry parts, the instruction sheets and associated ads and what have you. Um, this iron, according to the papers, is 1901. The iron probably is a little bit earlier than that. Um, again, all the parts, I can um, take the little wing nut off here. I have the little wrench here, which I can now loosen up the top. And I can now lift the top off, put the bottom aside. And I have this little unit here. This is a stand in which I can now set the bottom with the, um, the gasoline powered engine, so to say, and I will put some gasoline into here and I will fire that up. There'll be some flames and that is going to uh, vaporize the gasoline that's in the line and I can now freak with it a bit, get it started and put it into my iron tighten it up and I'm ready to go. I should tell you that this is a rather rare iron. This is the only iron I've ever seen from this manufacturer. Um, and the reason there is, coming out in 1901, well the Imperial uh, gasoline iron, the, the monitor iron which I haven't shown, and some others are literally right around the corner. And those irons are going to take this guy's market. My wife Kate has just been laughing through these videos because she's just incredulous at the at the process of utilizing gasoline pressing irons. But it was it was quite the thing. It was better than a lot of alternatives, especially in the rural regions in its day. We are have before us here a new leader iron. Um, this particular one has a patent date on the top of uh, 1894. There were some subsequent patents as well that suggest this iron was being marketed for some number of years. The um, the iron it's a it's a very stylish iron. You can see the Mrs. Potts lines again trying to trash transition people into the new technology, and it has a trivet, a nice big cast iron trivet, and. The trivet also has a shape and a pattern here that is quite similar to some of the trivets of the detachable irons, and we'll, we'll see some of those later on in another video. But it has this, this deep well, which you might imagine is where they would put some gasoline to light to heat up the insides of this iron. This particular iron, there's a, um, there's a latch here to take the bottom off. You would take the bottom off, I won't do that here, put it aside, and then you would set this onto the trivet 
you'd fire this up and now you're doing your little tweaking whatever to get the the gasoline vaporized to get this thing all working and once that is done then you would set it back on the base latch it and you'd be ready to go and again going back to earlier irons this is from the western lighting company um, with a patent date July 30th 1889 from Cleveland Ohio and this is a very early at least in, in American usage liquid fuel iron it has a very heavy brass tank um, it's overbuilt in the manner of the um, the early Taylor irons with a almost water faucet type knob up here and in back and I'm wondering if it probably was was used by Taylors. Um, the uh, I'm not really sure exactly how they fired it up. The top does not come off easily, um, and I will say that that this iron and other irons of this period, especially with with a with a patent date on it, are quite rare. I found this one in, on eBay and I paid uh, several hundred dollars for it but a beautiful, majestic, and unusual iron. It's been a while since we've seen a European iron. Um, this is a, a, a group of European irons done by various um, manufacturers in, in England and Germany and Austria, probably other places, and there were some American companies that made these as well. It has the sort of the ox tongue shape that we uh, saw in the slug irons in earlier time. Two rows of holes. Um, usually has this pointed forward handle, which is a very typical uh, European design. Uh, this particular one is the Omega. There's a nice little um, uh, spoon at the end, so I assume you can take some ladle some of that um, that fuel. And the way you would fire this one up is you would, again, the door opens in the back, again, just like a slug iron, and you would take this out, and the, uh, there would be a stand. I don't have the stand for this particular iron. Uh, these were made in various sizes, and we will see this again, I think, when we uh, talk about the um, travel irons, another separate category. So I would get this started, I would put this back up here and proceed from there. Um, I also might, while we're on this subject, uh, take a look at the, uh, at the trivet here. And these trivets, uh, very robustly built, pretty tall. Uh, the sunshine design and gargoyle figures and other kinds of designs here are quite interesting. And you see these all over the place in Europe very interesting trivets and in many many shapes and patterns so we have now talked about the coal natural gas and and liquid fuel irons and from here we'll start talking about some of the applications that these irons and these uh, fuels were put to starting with the Taylor irons in the next video Thank you very much. I uh, am getting some very nice comments. I am incorporating some of the trivets into my, uh, my lectures. Thank you, Ron, for that advice. And we shall move on.